Y'all, yeah, so as you can see, it is a few hours later. I do apologize for having to take that short little break. I hope you guys understand. Um, but anyway, I wanted to share with you how to show you the little haul I have from the library, yes, but not library books per se anymore. They're withdrawn books, so they were in the free book section. First, I'm going to show you, though, it's so crazy to see this, and I'm so glad I looked because they literally just put these out. This is Finding Dory in the free book section. And then they had 100 Ultimate 150 Cartoon Festival. I mean, it's disc three, but it's like Betty Boop and Popeye and Casper and all that fun stuff. So these were a huge win which is awesome. We love wins. All right. Then I picked up, I know you guys are like, wait a minute. Aren't you trying to unhaul books? Why did you grab more? Well, I found four books that uh, kind of spoke to me. One of them has green pages, which matches the green writing. So that's interesting. But I have no idea what these are about. Cover picked them up, title picked them up, that kind of thing. So Let's go ahead and start from the bottom and work our way through. So I have a book called Too Far to Walk by John Hersey. It says, is there anywhere a young man so dull he would not sell his soul for experience? In this striking new novel, quite different from anything he has written before, John Hersey probes deeply, but with rich humor, into the aimlessness, boredom, and rebellion of a group of undergraduates in a New England college. In one of his remarkable insights into the problems of our times, he identifies their search for breakthrough, intense sensory experience of every kind, with the Faustian pursuit of illusion. John Fisk was a talented overachiever in his first year at Sheldon, but then he suddenly lost his drive, his sense of purpose and identity. One of his friends promises him all the extreme experiences of modern life. Love, war, orgy, beach coming, poverty, sex, protests, and protests against protests. And total freedom. First there is Margaret, simple, open, affectionate. But Fist is restless and breaks with her after a marvelously funny and touching night in a motel. Then there is Mona, the bright, high-class whore who somehow knows quite a lot about how professors talk. This takes her home to its middle-class parents, and the masquerade turns into one of the most hilarious and yet moving scenes in the book. Even the devastating release of LSD is powerless to help Fist, who finally realizes that identity cannot come to him artificially through any escape, drug, or indulgence, but must be dredged up from deep within. Thus, John Fist becomes a man, and thus ends a rich and moving and distinguished novel about some very real conspiracies. No idea. But this is what it looks like. This is old, to say the least. This is looking like it's from 1966. Guys, this is what it used to look like. These are beautiful, okay? But this is a very old book. This is a 1966 book, so I have to be very careful with that. All right, next I got Frank Norris's At Last to Kiss a Man. At last to kiss Amanda. Um, again, it's going to be old because it's got the about the author on the back with the author photo, which we don't really do that much anymore. All right. Uh, the central figure in At Last to Kiss Amanda is Jackson Candless, a naturally acquisitive man of goodwill, a benevolent young industrialist who is partially a monarch to his family and friends amid the vast plantations and the factories that make up his business empire. Although married to an attractive and devoted wife, Jay Canlis has been deeply involved through the years with his beautiful cousin, Amanda. The tragedy and the fulfillment of this relationship is the theme of a novel filled with highly accomplished characterizations, drama, lyricism, and pervasive humor. At last, kiss Amanda opens with a scene in which Jay's best friend unaccountably commits suicide. In recalling all the events that have led him to the funeral, Jay Canlis is forced to examine the business friendships that might relate to the death, the personal ambitions, the loves, and the hatreds that have made him and nearly destroyed him as well. Jay's generosity and goodwill have been lavished, his compulsive philanthropy, as Amanda herself calls it, extending to everyone in his wider orbit except to himself. The book reaches its 
denouement at the shadow line of murder. It is sudden tragic death, accidental at least in appearance, which brings Frank Norris's superbly drawn characters into sharp focus and bitter conflict. Probing deeply into the character of a man who thought he was being kind and benevolent, At Last We Kiss Amanda is the story of Jake Handless deceptive last victory the very people he has helped try to faint frame him and in shattering conclusion even the funeral can be traced to jay's generosity and he realizes that murder might have been the alternative to the suicide in answer to jay's agonizing questions death even several deaths will bring neither a reason nor an ending and this one is 1961. um they sound very interesting they're the very weird basic dust covers but they spoke to me they're both the 1960s so great storylines i don't know why this one has green sprayed edges just on the top of both okay all right then i have um tom levine's zero and it looks like this i don't know what i was thinking i have no idea the song ends with a crash, ripping cheers out of the audience. Fists plunge up through the sweaty air. Someone shouts, you rock! You rock! Thanks a lot, the singer says into the mic at the bassist as the bassist moves to check something on its amplifier and the drummer stands to adjust a cymbal. Here's the thing. If you had a couple of priceless sapphires and held them up to the rays of the, of the setting sun in the moments after a sonoran monsoon... They'd be lifeless next to this guy's eyes. So I'm a girl. Sue me. But oh my god. My fingers ache for my paints. Something, anything I can use to capture those eyes forever. A blank canvas, the ceiling in my room, one dirty wall of the graveyard. I don't care. I need my paint now. Or my charcoals. It isn't just the color of his irises. It's the intensity in them I need to preserve for future generations. He's starting to sit down when our gazes meet. I freeze solid. Um, give me one second, because I can't see. Alright, sorry about that. Alright. So, nowhere to go, nothing to do, no one to talk to. For wannabe artist, Amanda Walsh, who goes by the nickname Zero, the summer before college was perfectly mapped out because she got into an art school that would take her far, far away from Phoenix, except she didn't get must-have scholarship money. Had awesome plans with her best friend, Jen, but they're not talking at all. Was fate... Fairly adept at dodging both of her parents through silence and evasion, yet somehow she's pulled into their fights, which just get louder and louder. Now Zero's prospects are looking as bleak and surreal as a painting by her idol, Salvador Dali. Will life truly imitate art, or will her new unexpected relationship with the punk skater boy and support from the unlikeliest of places help Zero understand that she's so much more than a name? As he did in the stunning debut party, author Tom Levine infuses Zero with memorable voices and relatably less than perfect relationships, making his storytelling totally addictive. Hmm. Interesting. And this one is from 2012. So there's that. And then the very last one I have is The Big Love by Sarah Dunn. And it's just this really interesting photo of a bed <laughs> with the big love i don't know what it's about i just saw it and i was like hmm, interesting sorry i'm trying to see something oh okay so, Allison Hopkins is firmly, undoubtedly, and undeniably in love. She and Tom live together. They send wedding gifts as a unit, and most important, they're happy together. Until the evening, Tom goes out in the middle of a dinner party to buy some mustard and doesn't come back. Calls Allison to say that he has fallen back in love with his ex-girlfriend, Kate, the kind of woman about whom men say rap rhapsodically, she's like a drug. How can Allison compete with that? She had always feared that Tom's looks would land her in trouble. Having a handsome boyfriend is like owning a white couch, an invitation to disaster. But if Tom isn't Allison's big love, who is? Allison is tempted to take her humiliation and whip it into 700 words for the weekly column she writes about relationships for the local paper. Instead, she decides to treat her newfound freedom as a gift, a shimmering portal to a whole new life, a whole new her. 
She risks the fling with her boss and makes the delightful discovery that movie sex, like that scene in Fatal Attraction, with the water running and the dishes in the sink, isn't a cinematic fiction. But that is just the beginning of Allison's quest for the big love. Applying her restless intelligence to all the questions of the heart in the modern age, is love in fact enough? Does an undefined yet presumably meaningless amorous encounter always turn out to be a mistake? What on earth do you tell your mother? Allison plumps the depths and takes sight of the heights that love can lead to. With a sharp eye, a skeptical wit, and an insatiable appetite for bridging the gulf between men and women, Sarah Dunn offers up a delectable first novel that is hilarious and heartbreaking, touching, and true. Sounds really good, and it is a 2004 book. So, those are the four books that I grabbed from the library for free. So, we have 1996 to all the way to 2012 right here. So, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But let's go ahead and knock that out of the park and get back to these lovely books here. These are the shorter chapter books um, for the triad chapter. This is going to be episode or part, not episode, but part 10, I believe we're on. No, we're on nine. It's part nine. So without further ado, give me one second and I will start reading. As I said in the last video, if the chapters are more than, I want to say nine or eight or nine pages, they will be done off screen and I will let you know what is being unhauled with a huge unhaul video after we go through the shelves. But if they are short chapters like these five books in my hand currently are, we will get through the first chapter together on here. Stay tuned. Okay, so I think I have these in order now. So we're going to start with Dave Moody's um, author of Hater, which um, this is Autumn. He's the author of Hater, which I have right here. We'll get to that one soon. But, um, it's a survival horror since Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. And let's get started by doing the... It's from 2010. We'll do the prologue first. Billions died in less than 24 hours. William Price was one of the first. He'd been out of bed for less than a minute when it began. He was halfway down the stairs when he felt the first stabbing pains around the inside of his mouth and the back of his throat. By the time he'd reached his wife in the living room, he couldn't breathe. The virus caused the lining of his throat to swell at a remarkable rate. Less than 40 seconds after initial infection, the swelling had almost completely blocked his windpipe. As he fought for air, the swellings began to split and bleed. He began to choke on the blood running down the inside of his trachea. Price's wife tried to help him, but all she could do was catch him when he fell to the ground. For a fraction of a second, she was aware of his body beginning to twitch and spasm, but by then, she'd also been infected. Less than four minutes after infection, William Price was dead. Thirty seconds later, and his wife was dead, too. A further minute, and the entire street was silent. Ooh! <laughs> Carl Henshaw was over three quarters of the way home before he realized anything had happened. The early morning sun was low on the horizon as he drove back from the Carter and Jameson factory just north of Billhampton. He'd been there since just after four, fixing an insignificant repair which had hardly warranted him being called out in the middle of the night. Excuse me. Simpson, the wily bastard who ran the night shift there, was too tight to pay for new machinery and too smart to have his own men fix the problem when he could call someone else out. He knew the maintenance contract inside out better even than Carl's employers. Never mind, he thought to himself as he tried to drink a cup of coffee with one hand, tune the radio with the other, and still keep the band moving, being on 24-hour call paid well. And Christ, did they need the money? Did they need the money? <laughs> he loved his family more than anything, but neither he nor Sarah had been prepared for the extra expense of having another mouth to feed. Gemma, their perfect little girl, was coasting was co costing them a fortune. Damn radio, must be something wrong with it, he decided. One minute there was the usual music interspersed with insane chatter and drivel, the next just silence, not even static. The final notes of the last song faded away and were replaced with nothing. The sun flashed through the tops of the trees, blinding Carla intermittently. He knew he should slow down, but he wanted to get home and see Gemma before Sarah took her to nursery. 
He shielded his eyes as he took a tight bend too fast, then slammed on his brakes as a small mustard yellow colored car raced to, toward him, career, careering down the middle of the road. He swerved hard to the right to avoid an impact and braced himself as the van bumped up the verge of the side of the road. He watched in his rearview mirror as the other car continued forward, its speed undiminished before clattering up the curb and thumping into the base of a wide oak tree. Carl sat unmoving in his seat and gazed into the mirror, unable for a moment to fully comprehend what had just happened. The sudden silence was unbearable. Then, as the shock slowly began to fade and the reality of the situation sank in, he got out of the van and ran over to the crash. His mind was racing, his focus entirely self-concerned. It'll be his word against mine, he anxiously thought. I wasn't concentrating. If he sues and they find against me, I'll probably lose my job. As it is, I'll have to explain why I... Carl stood in the middle of the road and stared at the body of the car's driver, slumped forward with his face smashed into the steering wheel. His legs heavy, he took another couple of nervous steps closer. The car had hit the tree at an incredible speed, making, it seemed, no attempt to either slow down or swerve. Its bonnet had hit so hard it had virtually wrapped itself right around the trunk. He opened the door and crouched down, face level with the driver. He knew immediately that the man was dead. His empty eyes stared at him, somehow seeming to blame Carl for what had just happened. Blood was pouring from a deep gash on the bridge of his nose and from his mouth, which hung open. It wasn't dripping. The thick crimson blood was literally pouring out and pooling under the pedals in the footwell. Suddenly, nauseous, Carl leaned over the crumpled front of the car and emptied the contents of his stomach in the grass. Gotta do something. Phone for help. He ran back to the van and grabbed his mobile from its holder on the dashboard. It's easier knowing he's dead, he tried to convince himself, feeling guilty for even daring think such thoughts. I can just tell the police that I was driving along and I found the car crashed into the tree. No one needs to know that I was here when it happened. No one needs to know that I probably caused it. No one was picking up. He looked at the phone's display and dialed 999. Strange. Plenty of battery power left and the signal strength was good. He canceled the call and tried again. Then again. Then again. Then another number. Then the office. Then the number of the factory he'd just come from. Then his home number. Sarah's mobile. His dad's house. His best mate. Nothing. No one answered. Get a grip, he told himself, trying not to panic. There had been no other traffic on the road since the crash. If no one's seen you here, his frightened and flawed logic dictated, then no one needs to know you were ever here at all. Before he could convince himself otherwise, he got back into the van and stared, started to drive. Maybe he called the police anonymously later, he decided, trying to appease his guilt. I don't even need to tell them about the body. I'll just tell them I've seen a crash at the side of the road. A mile and a half farther down the road, Carl spotted another car, his conscience getting the better of him. He decided to change his plan and stop and tell the driver about what he'd seen. Their safety in numbers, he thought. They could drive back to the scene of the crash, then report it together. As he neared the car, he saw that it had stopped, parked at an awkward angle across the dotted white line, straddling both lanes of the road. The driver's seat was empty, the door wide open. He pulled up alongside the car and saw that there were three people inside, a mother in the front and two children in the back. Their frozen faces were filled with agony and panic. Their skin was gray and he could see trickles of blood running down the chin of the boy nearest to him. He didn't need to look any closer to know that they were dead. He found the lifeless body of the missing driver a few minutes meters farther along the road sprawled across the tarmac carl slammed his foot down on the accelerator and raced away his head spinning hoping every time he turned a corner that he'd see someone alive who could help him or at least explain what had happened the farther he drove without seeing anyone however the more obvious it became that in the space of a few miles drive everything had been changed forever oh whoa everybody's dead okay so i'm just gonna like right off the bat david moody's writing really like appeases to me so with that being said i am definitely going to be keeping hater as well just so you guys are well aware all right next we got um does this speech make me look fat true stories and confessions um Best-selling authors Lisa Scottaline and Francesca Ceratella. Ceratella? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. So this is actually like different stories and things like that. But uh, this is from 2015. And they're not very long at all. So Lisa did an a, a, uh, introduction. 
It says, people go to the beach for lots of reasons, namely the sand, the sun, and the water. I go for the food. You might think there's no food at the beach, but if there's no food at your beach, come to mine. Food never tastes better than it does on the beach. How do I know this? From a lifetime of eating on the beach. You would think that the beach would be the last place you would eat if you're a woman self-conscious about her body, which is every woman in the world. But I grew up in a family of chubby Italian-Americans, and the flying Scotta lines didn't sweat the small stuff, especially the fact that none of us want... What was what you would call small. Mother Mary loved to cook and the rest of us loved to eat and none of us saw anything wrong with it. We had the time of our lives on the beach because we were so full of food. It's hard to be unhappy with a full tummy. This was before the invention of food guilt. And think back, because we Scotlands never had any food guilt. Food is love and we had a lot of love in our family. We would never feel guilty because we ate. We had guilt if we didn't eat. And we had guilt about wasting food, which was our version of a mortal son. So before any trip to the beach, Mother Mary would cook up spaghetti and meatballs so we could make spaghetti and meatball sandwiches to take to the beach. I know that not everybody has eaten spaghetti and meatball sandwiches, so here's the recipe. To make a meatball sandwich, put a ton of meatballs in a hoagie roll and smash the top down. You can serve it hot or cold, but you should serve it on the beach. Delicious. The spaghetti sandwich is made the same way. Put a lot of spaghetti on a hoagie roll and smash the top down. It also works hot or cold and is perfect for the beach because you'll spill so much tomato sauce on yourself that you'll have to go wash off in the water. Not that I ever did that. Less than 2,000 times. By the way, it goes without saying that you never put spaghetti and meatballs in the same sandwich. Just in case you were thinking about it, don't embarrass yourself or me. And of course, after we had our delicious meal on the beach, we would be looking around for dessert. And in those days, an angel would appear in the form of the ice cream man. This wasn't a man driving an ice cream truck like Mr. Softy, but a man who walked back and forth across the beach in the hot sun, wearing a white t-shirt and white long pants, lugging a massive cooler full of ice cream on his back. Mr. Tuffy. All the while, he'd be calling out ice cream and ices, ice cream and ices, like a town crier for saturated fats. And we would get our ice cream treats the first round of the day, but certainly not the last. Because ice cream tastes better on the beach, too. There's nothing that doesn't taste better on the beach. Mother Mary used to smoke on the beach, and she thought even cigarettes tasted better on the beach. You can tell we weren't health nuts. So then it won't surprise you that we couldn't swim. Neither my mother, my brother, Frank, nor I could swim at all. We never learned how, and to this day, we don't know. Don't ask why. The flying Scotlands are full of mystery. But my father could swim, and so for ex exercise, we would go down to the water's edge and watch him, like three beach balls looking out to sea. So given my altogether adorable childhood, it's hard to understand how I grew up and acquired food guilt. I can't believe I ate that. A generalized fear of carbohydrates and a lifelong worry about my weight. And I'm always on a diet, and I just now gained back the 10 pounds that I had lost last month. But more and more, especially in summertime when I'm sitting on the beach, I'm learning not to sweat it. To go back to the child that I used to be. To see myself through the loving eyes of my parents to eat on the beach and not to worry about whether every little thing makes me look fat. In fact, not to worry at all. And so that's very much the spirit of this book. It's full of funny stories and true confessions from my daughter Francesca and me. And though we write about our bodies, we know that weight doesn't really have any weight with us. It has to do with the stuff of life, yours and mine as women in the world. And it, its warm little heart is a secret message. Enjoy. Um, I personally don't like it. I don't like the uh, way that it's written. Um, it, I literally kept looking at the page because I... Uh, nah, nah, nah. Oh, I didn't show you guys what the cover looks like. So this is the cover. It looked like it was going to be fun and everything, but it's it's not. It's just not it for me, so I apologize. Um, I don't know why I apologize. I mean, this is my decision on these books. These are on my shelf and not yours. But, you know, it, it could be somebody else's cup of tea, but it's just not mine. I'm not really one to read books about weight and things like that. Now, there is a book I did read. I'm not going to lie. There is a book that I did read that dealt with a lot with weight, but she was like on a reality show and it's called One to Watch. And oh my gosh, I could not put it down. It was so good. I think it was a Once Upon a Book. No, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, Book of the Bug book. And it was so good. 
but um, let's get into the next one before I get too tired. Let me get three to go. Yeah, three to go. All right, so next is Michael Allen Nelson's Hex, The Sisters of Witchdown. And this reminds me of a show because of the burning teddy bear bunny looking thing. I don't remember the name of the show, though. And this is from 2015. Alright, so it says, uh, The first novel based on the Hexed comic. Lucy, Jennifer, and Nacio Das Neves, Lucifer for short, isn't your typical teenage girl. She's a thief who survives by stealing bad things from bad people in the magical underworld, hidden alongside our own. So when a policeman's daughter, Gina, is kidnapped by an inex inexplicable force, Lucifer is the only one who has a chance at getting her back. With the unsolicited help of Gina's friends, including Gina's boyfriend, David, Lucifer's investigation leads to the unfortunate truth of the kidnapping. Gina was taken by a creature of unspeakable evil, one of the seven sisters of Witchdown. Against all odds, Lucifer must use every magical tool hidden in her trick bag to steal her away into the shade and bring Gina back before the sisters sacrifice her for their own dark ends. But the closer Lucifer gets to Gina, the closer she gets to David. Lucifer must risk her life confronting demons, witches, and the cruel demigoddess who controls her destiny, all to save the one girl who stands in the way of Lucifer finally finding love. Prologue. Gina jumped when the phone rang. Hear noise. It's my boyfriend. I gotta go, guys. Bye.